It's Monday, July 1st, 2013. I'm Rim. I'm Scott. And this is Geek Nights Tonight. How to hide all your dirty pornography from the NSA. Let's do this. So I came home through Grand Central, which I don't do often anymore. I don't really have to. I think it was a train problem today also. I was about to say. It went away by the time I left work. Because when I got to Grand Central, the place was literally overflowing. Like people were trying to walk into entrances and could not because of the severe crush of people already inside. Mm. So I basically shove my way in and start shoving my way through because I was just trying to get down to the seven train in there. I am the shover robot. There are people lined up in lines that will easily take them over an hour to buy tickets at every ticket counter. Every ticket, every ticket machine on the upstairs floor had lines that were longer than lines I've seen for roller coasters. And the concourse was filled with people. Most of them were taking pictures and looked like tourists, but it was denser than I've ever in my life seen it. You know what I learned the other day that you, you don't realize? I didn't realize for years, in fact, until the other day. What, there's a stairway and that little thing in the middle? The shove a robot pushes and the push a robot shoves. That, that was kind of the joke. <laughs> <laughs> that, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't figure out what was up, but then I finally shove my way through the crowd and I get down to the subway. So and you push a robot. Down there. Well, yeah, because I shove. <laughs> down there, there's like four ticket machines and no people. <laughs> so I think it was mostly tourists who were in the... I don't know what was up. It was mm-hmm. weird. Who knows? Yeah. Uh, side note, which is mildly technologically related. Mildly. Well, yeah. We're, you know, we're going to PAX so We'll save that for the meta moment. But it's I coming. needed... You know, electrical conversion equipment. I own pretty much every electrical conversion thing because of all my work travel. Yeah, well, I bought on Amazon the highest rated thing. Was the these. one you link to is the one I bought at work just because. Yeah, it ad- it adapts three, uh, you know, Australias <laughs> to just changes the shape of the Australian plug to the American plug. In fact, yep. all kinds of plugs uh, into Australian plug. So you can plug all sorts of things in. And Australia, if you have non-Australian electronic devices. As long as those devices take 230 volts. Well, I thought it, it... So the thing is this, right? If you look at your electronic devices, right? For example, a laptop with a transformer, it'll say something on it, like, you know, 110 through some number, right? And as long as, you know, it's a, the wide enough range, you're good. Well, most modern devices that are charging something that is in the NDC and has a little, you know, a wart on it, They'll take between 110 and 240. Right. The thing is, I went and looked at all my things just to check this because I never really checked it recently. Yeah, when I travel, I pretty much I mean, when I last time I went to a country that had different electricity for an extended period was in the year 2000. I went to Israel, and I didn't bring a lot of electronic things with me that needed charging because that, you know... Even now, I pretty much just bring... I bring, like, laptop, cell phone... Maybe Kindle, everything mostly charges with USB. Yeah, I'm going to bring more stuff to this than any other country I've ever been to. Anyway, I noticed the 3DS, an essential traveling electronic, the AC adapter, no, no supporting foreign country voltage. Nope, no. That's the only one of all the ones that I checked, like my camera, battery chargers, and everything. Is the only oh, one. I, I looked on Amazon, like, oh, duh, I'll make fun of you and be like, look, you can buy one for five bucks. No, all the ones I can find are not actually available for sale. Yep. They're all sold out. You know what I did buy on Amazon? What'd you buy? A 3DS charger that is nothing more than a USB cable with a 3DS plug at the other end. That is a much better idea. Because I just have to freaking... Get a USB out of something else, and oh, it's all set. What? Really? All right. On Amazon, there is one guy selling that, one. That's eBay. Yeah, but it was linked to from Amazon. Anyway. What? I don't know. Anyway. Anyway. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know how much I'll use my 3DS there. I'm mostly going to be playing tabletop games and well, console games. Yeah, I mean, I'm saying if I drain it on the plane... And I'm going to be there, you know, I'm going to need I'm a charger for the way back. I'm going to try to mostly sleep on the plane. When I'm not sleeping, I'm going to try to read and review the panel shit. Yeah, but it's going to be fucking like 24 hours on the plane. Yeah, I've, That's I've, plenty I've, of time to do those things and have time left over. <laughs> Actually, I'm going to try to finish all my typing for Beantown. Yeah, also, what about the plane back? I'll just sleep the whole time. The 12, 24 hours sleeping nonstop. I can do that. I'll just get super drunk and fall asleep, and then I'll wake up at home. You wake up in New York? Or I'll wake up in L.A., and I miss my connecting flight. <laughs> yeah, okay, it's all you. I'm going to play some video games at least part of that time for some hours. So a thing in New York 
for many of you who don't realize, you know, I bike to work almost every day. Scott bikes to work. Emily even bikes to work. A lot of us bike to work because it's biking is faster than the subway unless you're going. Is this still away. an open event? Because these are things that we've talked about in open events like a hundred times. That well, people because now like this is getting hear. into my news. I'm going to review some technology I've been using. Whoa, geek so, bite. My trouble is I have an expensive bike. It would be a felony to steal it. Mm -hmm. However, New York City is the bike stealingest city in America, nay, the Western Hemisphere. <laughs> nay, the universe. Seriously, people steal bikes so frequently, especially in Manhattan, that basically I can't leave my bike anywhere. Unless it's inside. Or yeah, Fort so Knox. biking to work is fine, but if I want to bike out to lunch in Manhattan, there is literally nothing you could say that would convince me my bike will be safe for more than 30 seconds out of my sight, no matter how many chains I put on it. Mm -hmm. So I actually signed up for City Bike, which, you know, C-I-T-I. It's the sort of bike share program that's being set up in New York City. It's in Manhattan, south of 59th Street, and it's in Dumbo and some areas like right over the bridge in Brooklyn. It's this thing where you get a little card, it's got a little RFID or something in it. It's on my keychain. I stick it in, and then I just immediately take a bike. I get 45 minutes to take that bike wherever I want, but as long as I put it back into another station before the end of that 45 minutes, I don't have to pay anything. And if I go over, it's like 250 mm. for another 45 minutes or whatever. Mm. So I don't have any by our apartments, so I can't use it to bike all the way home, but I basically got it as an experiment and to kind of support this thing. So thus, my review of this technology. One, these, gear, these bikes are steel-framed monsters. They weigh about as much as all those bullshit bikes that we see people riding in other countries. Mm -hmm. There's this the ones big steel ride step in Wildwood. They weigh like 45 pounds, if I had to guess, by picking one up. Mm. They are massive. Two, the brakes don't work for shit. Shitty brakes, huh? What kind of brakes are they? Uh, They're kind of obscured, but they're like linear pull, just hand brakes. Usually those are pretty powerful. Linear pull has, you know, with the, with the properly calibrated levers is like actually like the strongest braking force. So I'm suspecting part of the reason they are so terrible is that I get this thing going it's at pretty so much heavy. max speed it's and physics. the sheer momentum. Yep, mass. Three, the seats are pretty well adjustable. Inertia. But just because of the way they're uh, kind of kitted out, the first time I rode one, I actually hurt my back kind of badly. <laughs> well, it's got sort of a derpy seat, right? And you got to adjust the height of the seat. Yep, I, but I had to stand up and kind of pump it to get going. And I, and I basically, because was it of the, the wobble, highest gear? You know, it, uh, we'll get to that. Okay. So because of how heavy and slow they are, it's really hard to get them going in a reasonable span. You got to kind of like run with it and then jump onto it. And you can't just start going. So I used to, when I first saw them on the streets, I'd make fun of people in my mind because I'd see everyone on a city bike like wobble to a stop and then wobble every time they started. Yeah, I wobble too on these fuckers. <laughs> the gears. So it has a three speed Shimano hub, right? Yeah, uh, yes. Three speed hub, hub gears. Now, some people in the forum have been trying to maintain that hub gears are in any way currently a reasonable replacement for a standard do. When I see a, a hub gear in the Tour de France, then we'll talk. Now, aside from the fact that not there aren't really many hub gear systems that have the same maximum ratio as my do. <laughs> hub gears in my experience, suck balls. And the <laughs> ones in the city bikes suck more balls than the ones I am used to. Mm. They only have three speeds, which in America is actually the standard. It's very rare to see a hub gear that has more than three speeds. Well, here. really, you know, if you have three speeds, that's actually sort of enough for New York City, right? There isn't well, it's, really it's, too many places you're going to need. I mean, if you have five, you're really set for the city. There's no giant hills. Yeah. The biggest hill I can think of is the back of Central Park, which you should be able to get so up in So in casual gear. riding, I'll get it to the top gear and then I have to just stop pedaling because I'm pedaling at my max cadence and there is no way for me to pedal to make the bike go faster. Mm, mm, mm. It, 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 needs, it needs two more gears, really. Mm. But luckily for the kinds of riding that it's intended for, like go out to lunch, go to the grocery store, the three gears are kind of adequate, but it's very frustrating to use the hub gear system. One, despite what people tell you, 
Hub gears do not immediately shift. Mm. Now, they, they people claim that most hub gears have an advantage where you can shift and keep pedaling. You don't have to worry about, like, letting up on the tension. The, the well, that's kind of also true. There's certain uh, derailleur gears where the teeth on the cogs are a certain shape. Mine has this, where you can just keep pedaling and well, yeah, click. You can, you you don't can have to... keep pedaling. However, it is best practice on pretty much every bike to continue pedaling, but very slightly lessen up on the forward pressure against that little bit. You know when you feel that point where it catches in the ratchet? Mm. You basically want to let up a tiny bit right when it shifts. But with did it is, when you shift, you especially in modern bikes with the, the sort of trigger shifters, you get this two-step where you push the thing and there's a click and then you have this like moment where you let go and you can time it really well. Hub gears, you twist it, and then at some point in the next like 1.75 rotations, it kind of starts for a second and then it's in the other gear. There's a significant, noticeable, annoying delay in shifting, mm. especially on these cheap hub gears. Uh, also, because it's a twist gear and there's no sort of two-step like I'm used to, and because it's really easy to twist it, I guess because people might have trouble with it, if you, t if you are riding the bike, it is very easy to just accidentally shift into the easiest gear and then basically destroy your nutsack. <laughs> <laughs> that happened to me like seven times. Mm. I'm an experienced biker, and I'm, ex I'm even used to having bikes with these stupid hubs and these stupid twist shifters and everything. They ride... You know what they ride like? If I had to describe the what it's like riding a bike like this, it's like riding the kind of motorcycle or motorbike that you give a 13-year-old in the Midwest. Mm. Like, they had a motorbike every kid a I mini knew bike? had. Yeah, they'll go, like, maybe 15 miles an hour, 20, if you, like, put the throttle all the way it's out. like Power Wheels? Uh, step up from Power Wheels. <laughs> P -p -p -power, pow, power Wheels. Pow. I believe you mean Pow, Pow, Power well, Wheels. Well, I was discussing pow, a cardboard Power, power wheels. wheels. That's why I went P -p 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 Power Wheels. Like the P -p -p Power Book? Yes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, in conclusion, I, uh, I did some experimentation. I biked. Basically home. I couldn't bike all the way home, so I biked to Grand Central multiple days with a city bike from my office. It takes me 28 minutes from when I start pedaling to when I'm in front of my apartment building, which is, you know, not that bad. It took me 32 minutes on average to bike just to Grand Central, which is only two thirds of the way home. Mm. The lack of efficiency due to the combination of shitty gears, extreme weight, terrible tires, basically makes me significantly slower to the point that it adds 15 plus minutes to my average commute home. So that's a half hour a day you're losing there if you were going to use city bike to go all the way home. Yeah, you really can't use city bike to go more than a mile or two. I think that's what it, I think really the best use of it is simply to extend subway stops, right? Exactly. Like, there are people who live... Close to a subway, but not close enough that they can really walk there in the morning. So those people own cars. Even you, imagine you, if there's a city bike thing in front of your apartment yeah, building. Yeah, I'm and close enough one... to walk to the subway, but it still takes a few minutes. If I could take a city bike to the subway station from my apartment, it would take like five minutes, not even less, like two minutes. Like, whoosh, you're there instantly. And that would be a huge convenience. And thus, people who lived even further away from the subway could get to the station in the same time it takes me to walk to the station. Currently, they have to own a car where they live, you know, maybe along the Hudson or, you know, way north Astoria or way northeast closer to LaGuardia, like the Steinway type people. It's like they're, you know, kind of a little far away from the subway station, but they had a bike, you know, that they could just not worry about getting stolen if they leave it at the subway station all day. They'd be all set. Yeah. So the other, the cool technological things they do, one, the, the stations where you get them are kind of solar powered and they basically just have car batteries in them. Because mm. I saw a guy replacing them, like just normal car batteries. Yep. And despite all the news articles that keep talking about the system being super unreliable, I've literally never had a problem. Mm. And the key is the way, the best part about it is that literally you walk up, you put your little key in, you just immediately take the bike. Mm -hmm. When you're done, you just shove it in, turns green, you're done. The fact that they made it that easy and that quick is great. All right. So, yeah, that's the technology. If hub gears suck. They're not there yet. Maybe someday, but there are physical and mechanical limitations of how good a hub gear can be. Yeah, I mean, look, I used to be like, yeah, I don't need that fancy road Lance Armstrong bike, right? And then I rode one, and I was like, oh, you pedal like once, and you're going 30, and you barely have to put any effort into it. That well, is crazy. Yesterday... <laughs> 
I rode a city bike to Grand Central, but then when I was home, or no, Friday, whatever day it was, and then I later got on my own bike and went riding, and it it was almost, I felt like my normal bike was magic. <laughs> magic. magic. All right, news. I'm not coming back. So, yeah. Uh, So, I read this really interesting story today about somebody who scammed Reddit, right? Scammed Reddit? So, you know the site Quick Meme where you can make memes real easily? Oh, yeah. I use that site kind of often. Right. So, you should stop using it because basically what happened is, long story short, guy who works on that site, one of the people who owns it, uh, scammed his... Oh, no. I don't use Quick Meme. I use a different similar site. Oh, well, you're not going to use that different similar site either when I'm done with the story. All right. So he somehow became, perhaps through a rigged election, a moderator of Our Advice Animals, which is pretty much meme central. And he was, you know, basically voted up all the Quick Memes and downvoted all the posts that were using competitors to Quick Meme and such and such. Right. Eventually, through much investigation, that is quite interesting and described in this article, he was found out and Quick Meme was banned from Reddit. And even if it gets unbanned from Reddit, it will never be unbanned from Advice Animals. And the guy's kind of scummy and it shows you, yeah, he was trying to, you know, he was afraid of competition. He was trying to beat them through devious means, but ended up defeating himself because he was being shady. And the internet doesn't take to that shit like the real world does. Trying to figure out what fucking meme maker I use now. I'm going to tell you which one you're using starting now because I learned in this article that, yeah, you know, there was quick meme and the competitor that they were trying to beat was live meme. Right, which is the one they were worried about because it had better features than they had. Yeah. But you know what? Imgur now makes memes, so done and done. Well, what I've been doing now, mm-hmm. what's oh, I used to I used memegenerator.net. Okay, yeah, just use it. But Imgur now. The way I used memegenerator.net because they have a good sort of they actually have a good internal ranking system. I make my meme and then I drag it into my Imgur account. Mm. Yeah, that's what most people do. But Imgur now has a meme thing, so you don't need to use anything else that's has a bad user interface, and it's of course already on Imgur. Well, maybe so this is what I use. I'm not sure who I step. use. Well, you're starting right now using Imgur meme. I probably just use a random one every time. <laughs> maybe, <laughs> but for now on, you can use the Imgur one. Oh my gosh! And yeah, this story is really interesting uh, to show you know just how you cannot scam your way around Reddit and such. I was pretty fascinated by the. Detective process. Huh. Mm. Well, I know Reddit does crazy stuff like you'll get down votes in some proportion to your upvotes so that <laughs> what they can do, and they uh, other forums have done this before. I've actually toyed with the idea of making a vanilla plugin to do this if no one already did. But they'll do things like that to obscure well, the effect of your up and down votes so that if you make a spam bot and it's caught, the spam bot won't know that it's not affecting anything anymore. This is this is not even close to anything related to that. No, but I'm saying like there's clever stuff that goes on in these sites. I'm that sure there don't know might about. be, yeah, but this has nothing to do with that. This is a guy who was gaming the system. He was a moderator. But anyway, things of the day. So I've been on a civil war kick lately. I don't know why. Maybe I'm just old enough, and as far as I can tell. Every man in America, or at least someone who identifies as a gender male, the older they get, the more interested they get in the Civil War for some reason. Not me. I, You're I'm, not old enough yet. I'm more interested in trains. This has just been my Choo-choo. weird, maybe it's just my experience, but every relative I've known, a lot of the adult, as time goes on, the Civil War, and particularly like the Ken Burns documentaries and all that stuff, just becomes more and more a part of their lives. Okay. <laughs> but uh, also Crash Course finally got to... The Civil War. Oh, I still haven't watched any of that. Nor have I watched that British show with the peasant and such. Oh, my God. The, the Crash Course is way better than the peasant and such I haven't such watched show. any one of those. You should. They're great. But he finally got up to the Civil War. The thing he doesn't talk about is the battles and the bullshit. He just talks about, you know, the politics and the society and the consequences. Nice. So for anyone who actually cares about the details of these battles, like, you know, war gamers and grognards... Uh, this is actually a super awesome site, civilwar.org, but they have a thing that I'm linking to the Battle of Shiloh for, and if you don't know what the Battle of Shiloh was, then I guess you're not old enough. (laughs) Basically, (laughs) what they do is they take you through kind of the chronological progression of every individual major battle in the Civil War. Like, move for move, this army went here, this army moved here, these guys did this, this guy got shot, uh, this happened, that happened, it's over, here's pictures of bodies. 
All right. They're just really, really well put together. And considering that uh, we just overturned the most important part of the Voting Rights Act, mostly in the South, in Texas, I don't know, two hours later, past their let's not let poor and black people vote anymore law. Uh, uh. So, yeah. Let's never go to war forget. with them. They won't win, right? <laughs> History. <laughs> we, one thing we learned from the Civil War, we'll win. So just to, the two things, the reason I made this my thing of the day, one, never forget the Civil War was pretty the much Alamo? just about slavery. And at the Alamo, we were kind of the bad guys. Yes. <gasps> Second thing to never forget, the Civil War was actually crazily advanced compared to warfare in the rest of the world at its time. And the reason, the main reason that World War I was as horrifying as it was is because the entire world ignored the American Civil War and didn't learn anything from what happened over here. Nope. No one cared about this. I mean, how much do you know about civil wars in other countries besides the U.S.? That's the thing about civil wars is that other countries don't learn about uh, other countries' civil wars too often. I learned a lot about the civil war in Britain. Mm -hmm. I also learned a lot about the sort of on-again, off-again civil wars within France. Not once in the, my history classes ever did they teach us about a civil war other than the American Civil War. Uh, aspects of partition were, were very reeking of civil wars. Mm. Anyway, the your but pointedly European generals ignore like if they had just paid attention to what happened over here, they kind of looked at America like this backwater and like oh the the Americans are fighting, let them fight it out. We have our own you know big boy European stuff to do, and history kind of glosses over that basically modern warfare began with the American Civil War. Mm. Anyway. So, thing of the day, a lot of times, you know, various products will cooperate with licensed properties to promote their products. For example, Hello Kitty Band-Aid. What does Hello Kitty have to do with Band-Aids? Not fucking much. But if you like Hello Kitty and you need Band-Aids, that might convince you to buy a Hello Kitty Band-Aid instead of a regular Band-Aid. But sometimes, once in a blue moon, such a partnership promotion deal just makes fucking sense. In a glorious fashion. And us, I present to you the Star Wars Pocky promotion. Lightsaber Pocky, the end. Watch these videos. Duh. Really? No, they're really crazy. I'm going to the gross Japanese grocery to get pretty much everything on the list. <laughs> I'm sure they'll have it. So in the meta moment, the book club book is Stasi Land, a series of short non true stories. Wah, wah. About what it was like to live in East Germany and deal with the Stasi and that whole, you know... Awful. That horrifying era that a lot of people don't seem to really think too much about, considering the majority of Americans are totally okay with what the NSA has been up to lately. It was really bad. Not quite as bad as Nazi times, but still really bad. And not quite... We have it better, but that doesn't mean that what we have is good either. We're going to be at... Not next, not this weekend, but next weekend, Kineticon. Not only running the panels department, but doing a smorgasbord of panels. When are we going to have time to do panels? We're running panels. Oh, well, we'll manage that. Okay. And We've been managed before. Then, that next weekend, we're going to be in Melbourne, Australia, presenting Beyond Melbourne. Dungeons and Dragons on Friday at 1 p.m. in the Wombat Theater. Rabid Wombat Theater. And we will very soon be able to announce our uh, lecture schedule for PAX Prime. Which we're definitely going to again. Yes. We are, it looks like we're going PAXs to be doing... Two PAXs within a month or two. <laughs> you realize what we, the fuck? If we go to Dev as well, that means in the last two years... So think about it. In, in a two-year span, it was Prime East, Prime Dev, East, Aus, Prime Dev. <laughs> One, two, three, four, five, six, seven packs is oh two years. Oh, my God. Too many packs. Or not enough packs. <laughs> Definitely not enough packs. We'll probably be doing a lecture that we're entitling Bad Games. I'm kind of upset because I don't think... I'll be able to go to, unless some lottery happens, which is not going to because I don't buy tickets. You won't be able to go to Oz every year. I'm not going to go to Oz next year. So that's going to be the first PAX I miss since 08. Most likely will be PAX Oz 2014. Well, we didn't go to the first PAX Dev. We went to the second one. That's true. But I don't really, PAX Dev is different from a PAX. True. I, I enjoy as, some aspects of PAX Dev more than some aspects of PAX. Mm. Case in point, PAX Dev does not have an expo hall. No. <laughs> 
<laughs> Pax Dev gives us coffee. <laughs> and tea. Are you gonna, are you saying that the next when you go to Pax Aus, you're not going to go to the Expo Hall at all because you don't like it? Uh, I will walk through it once, as I do. That's what I do as well. But the never forget. That's been my thing, I guess today. Never forget. Never forget that there was a convention we went to once, and that convention had a policy of free beer, free unlimited beer for all attendees for the entire weekend. And that convention was the same convention that Neil Gaiman told his stories at. We met uh, Steve Jackson, didn't know who he was, blew him off, and wouldn't let him play set. Uh, How many Puerto times are you going to tell us. this story? And that was PenguinCon 2.0. Mm-hmm. Free beer. So we're not going to pretend we know exactly what the NSA has been up to, because we don't. Uh, we, all we know from what's been leaked so far is that they're collecting metadata and using that. And I, th- I started to realize, I think a lot of people don't really understand what's going on and what the scandal is with Snowden and the NSA and the leaks and everything. More importantly, all the people I know who do care really don't know what to do about it. Well, I mean, because it, it's actually the people who are technologically competent and understand what's going on have known about this forever. That's why most of us were like, uh... Yeah, and it's, I was like, I was, it was so weird to me that, that, like, I basically have seen this same news story hundreds of times before. Like, government has a crazy carnivore program spying on everybody on the internet. Uh, Project government, Echelon. Yeah, AT&T, uh, unwar- no warrant wiretaps from the government. You know, oh my God. And it's like, basically, you know, Patriot Act. This uh, news, this is like the 30th time I've seen this news in the past decade. And only nerds freaked out the first few times, and then nerds were like, yep, business as usual. Well, nerds are pretty much the only people who ever freak out about things. And and for some reason, this time, the same exact news comes around again, and I saw it, and I was like, oh, same news as always, All right, I didn't really think much of it, and then it was exploding even into the regular news for days and days and days, and I'm like, what? Why is this 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 special? What? I think the difference is, one... Why didn't you freak out last time? The average person basically ignores anything nerds freak out about on the internet. Of course. So, and also... The average person ignores what activists freak out about. So when a lot of smart people were protesting the Patriot Act and marching and doing all their political activism about it, the average person said, what are those hippies up to? Mm -hmm. Whatever they're for, I'm against. (laughs) And a lot of people were actually... I'm also against what hippies are for, them hippies. Kind of okay (laughs) with the Patriot Act. I'm still not okay with it. But at the same time, what do I do? What? Not vote for the people who voted for it? Then I can't vote for anyone. (laughs) Your vote will not matter. Not that it matters anyway. But at least we vote for mayor. That matters, kind of. Yeah, we can. And actually, our mayor race is going to heat up. Three crappy choices. Uh, We have way more than three. Some crappier than others. You want to vote for the rent is too damn high? Do you know who's running? (laughs) Yeah, there's, um, I forget her name. Quinn? Yeah, the lady. Do you know anything about her? Uh, she's very liberal, awesome kind of person in general. All right. Yeah, who else is running? Scott, there Mm. are currently... Can't... Yeah, none of those people... Can, only three people have a chance of winning. Uh, real depends. I mean, right now, remember, there's the primary, which has to happen first. And in the primary, there are like 11 people running. Yeah, only two of those people can win. Who? Which two? Uh, Quinn and Wiener. But I don't know. Wiener, I think they're saying he has more votes than he actually Wiener has. Wiener has been rising in I the think polls that that lately. Might there's be a, there's a polls. turgid forward momentum in Wiener's candidacy. I think those are fake polls. In fact, you could say that his poll numbers are swelling. Yes, I think those might be... I only stole one manu- of those jokes from another podcast. I think those <laughs> might be manufactured polls of some Well, the some thing sort. is, they're just recently. Mm. Basically, he's polling between 17 and 25 percent and quinn's polling between 19 and 20 percent yeah we'll see what happens and then there's the republican guy undecided. we're definitely not voting for yeah republican guy not voting for you dude what's his name thompson something johnson i don't know well actually yeah there well there's <laughs> uh there's loda who has the highest polling right now but almost half of republicans are undecided because they just don't care they're not gonna win and of course it's new york <laughs> but anyway <laughs> Political activism seems to just turn off normal people. Just kind of, basically activism of any kind, the average person just kind of immediately just gets... Just one justice, you want quiet. Exactly. <laughs> but seriously, guys, the Patriot Act was passed a long time ago. And also, even if there hadn't been all these stories about the things that happened over all these years, I pretty much assumed the fact that the only leak we got was that they're collecting the metadata. 
I pretty much assume they're gathering everything at this point. Okay, so anyway, the original point is that nerds were not surprised, right? Normal people, for some reason, this time paid attention and were surprised. Well, the difference is the difference between when Al Capone you is You keep a- going on a tangent here. Nerds already know what to fucking do about it, right? I don't think they do. Most of them do. I the don't ones think that a lot n- of our listeners know what to do. Then they're not tech nerds if you don't know what to do. I don't think there's right. that many tech nerds. That's what I'm saying. But the tech nerds who knew about it were on Slashdot, those kind of people, already knew what to do about it. And if they cared, were already doing what they were doing about it. Right? And the other people, they're the ones who don't know, but now they suddenly care. So you have a situation where the people who cared were also the people who knew and the people and did something about it already. So it was sort of like, okay, we're done. But now we have a new influx of people who care, didn't know about it before, but still don't know what the fuck to do about it. And the answer is, in short, to do anything about it will make your computer using very inconvenient, but also secure. Because for some security, especially security that fucking works, you have to trade away convenience. There is yep. no way around that. So if you care that much, how much do you care? How much trouble and effort are you going to go through to keep the government from reading and spying on your shit on the internet? Ask yourself that question. So now we can go through basically the levels of paranoia. Like every level up is increased paranoia, increased protection, increased Increased inconvenience. inconvenience. (laughs) Which is the reason I do not do most of these things. I also do not do most of these things. My paranoia level is low and my convenience desire is high. And also I don't really have things to keep secret. But if I did, I would probably do more stuff. I think what helps is that we live kind of open lives, partly because of Geek Nights. And do... uh, I'm all. I mean, it's already kind of public knowledge that we're both members of the most hated minority in America. So, there's not. I mean, if someone, if we ever ran for political office, people just have to be like atheists. Here's evidence, and we'd be done. So, if we were into, I don't know, baby telephone porn, that's against the law. Pretty sure. Probably. We, we should go to jail. So probably should. But that would not. I'm not, and don't take that as I'm making an argument of you don't do anything wrong. What do you have to keep secret? Because we all know the answer to that argument. Yep. (laughs) But it's just I personally choose to not care that much because I personally don't care about keeping things secret. But nonetheless, level one, the level one of protecting yourself and paranoia is having some form of locally encrypted file system, Mm, mm, mm. any kind. I mean, I have a TrueCrypt volume. It's like 50 megabytes. I put passwords in there. I put small amounts of data in there, sensitive files about things that if someone who didn't like me got a hold of them could probably cause me a significant amount mm-hmm. of financial hardship. Yep. Those files and those passwords and all that are in this little encrypted file, and I just put it on Google Drive because it's encrypted. The fuck are they going to do? Yeah, it's really simple to do this. You get a piece of software that handles it for you, like TrueCrypt, and you basically have files... And sometimes, you know, you have to type in a password when your computer turns on, and sometimes you type in a password when you access the files, and pretty much no one can read those files who is not you. Yep. That's all there is to it. Now, it basically causes no inconvenience. If I want to access those files, I just mount it That's and type still a password. technically an inconvenience that you have to type a password now when you did not previously. But I have to type a password to open my computer anyway. That's true. The, the, the amount sometimes of added inconvenience can is negligible. Yeah, sometimes you can configure it where simply logging into your user account also decrypts the keys that are on the computer. More importantly, it gives me something I couldn't do before, so it gives me an increased convenience of because I have encrypted it in this manner, I can put it somewhere public. I can post it to FARC and Reddit for all I care and download it whenever I need it. Mm -hmm. So I put it on Google Drive. I don't have to trust Google at all. Yep, this is really good stuff. For example, if you want to cross country borders, right? So let's say Australia was an evil country, way super evil. I mean, they're they're not. They're not perfect, right? (laughs) But they're not, you know, they're not like freaking, you know, China or some shit, right? And I go into Australia and get some data. I upload that shit to the internet in Australia, obviously over an encrypted channel with a VPN or something, which we'll get to. And it's encrypted and it's on Google Drive. And then I delete all my hard drives and my SD cards. And then I go back to the US and then I download it. And I just cross the borders with the data and the customs people couldn't do shit because I walked across with a bunch of blank drives and disks. Yep. Maybe I'll have a clean Windows install so it looks like it's for real. I don't know. I guess we should back up. There is a level zero. Don't install malware bullshit and compromise your computer. (gasps) If you do that, then level one doesn't mean anything. That's right. (laughs) 
if there's a key logger, if there's an ask.com malware toolbar, if there's anything on your computer, mm-hmm. if you inst- if you ever installed Wares, you probably have a virus. Yeah. An addendum to level one is something you can do is make that encrypted drive a USB stick. And then you can physically hide that USB stick. So if the government ever comes to like confiscate all your computers, all your stuff is on this USB stick that they're not going to find. Yeah, remember in Hackers? Hey, I put it in that place. I put that thing that one time. Yep. That doesn't mean anything. That's actually a code. But, but you know, you can leave it somewhere that's not in your apartment, perhaps like with a neighbor or something, right? And your neighbor can't do anything with it because it's encrypted. It's encrypted. Yeah. Leave it at your parents' house. I don't know. Whatever. Like I said, it's, it's the kind of, you can live, put it... Publicly post it. Publish it in the newspaper mm-hmm. if you can yep. give it small enough. Right. Also, part of level one is whenever you type, this should be something everyone just does in general. It's like almost sort of level 0.5. But yeah, level one, if you are typing something into a website on the internet and sending that information across the internet to somewhere, you know, an email in your Gmail or something, right? Look and make sure the SSL thingy is on and correct, right? Actually click on the lock and like look what it's saying. And you make you want to see if it has forward secrecy. It'll also might have letters like E C D H E, which basically means forward secrecy. Forward secrecy is very important. That means that, yeah, even if the government is recording all of this encrypted stuff that you're sending over the SSLs over the internet, if sometime later they get the key. They won't be able to decrypt everything they've ever captured from you. They'll need to get many different keys to do that, right? They'll only get a little bit of data if they crack it, which, you know, as opposed to if you don't have that and they get the key there and they crack it, they're going to decrypt everything they've ever recorded of you and your Gmails or whatever. So be careful for that one. All right. So just whenever you type something in, don't type it in. If you care about the government seeing it or anyone seeing it, Make sure the lock is on, and it'll only be sent between you and the person you're sending it to and no one else. So level two, some sort of VPN like iPredator. Oh, yeah. That is probably, level two is probably as far as most of you ever get currently, because level two- It's also pretty easy to do. Is what people use to pirate things if they're worried about getting in trouble for piracy. So what a VPN does, I think we've explained it before, so I'll just be real quick, is it basically creates a secure tunnel between you and another spot on the internet. So for example, iPredator, I think, is usually between you and somewhere that Pirate Bay has a server in Europe somewhere, like Sweden or something, or France. And basically, all the traffic on your computer... But when it comes out of your computer, gets encrypted and gets sent to France or Sweden, and when then it goes onto the internet like normal, then it comes back to that spot in Sweden or France, and then gets encrypted and sent back to you. Now, both SSL and VPNs require you to trust the person on the other end. Mm-hmm. So if Google is the certificate, Google can do whatever they want. They're, they can decrypt the same data you're sending them or else your web page wouldn't work. That's the point. The point of SSL and VPN is that you're sending data to this other person you trust, perhaps Google, PayPal, and only they are getting it. No one in between you and PayPal is looking at your credit card number that you just typed in. Right? It's getting to PayPal securely. But you have to trust PayPal. PayPal could just spill the beans to the feds. But in the same way, it's the idea of trust networks. If I give Scott a thing and then he blabs and tells everyone, I mean, there's nothing I can do about that. That's right. If you direct message someone on Twitter or have a locked Twitter account and someone just copy and paste all your tweets because you let them follow you. <laughs> that's why I don't understand the point of locked Twitter accounts. They're completely stupid. They're kind of silly. They defeat the entire purpose. I guess they're for people who want to use Twitter and talk to their friends, but actively want to avoid anyone else interacting with them. I guess if you didn't broadcast anything, if you were only doing like, you know, you only wanted like direct message and at friends, like an instant messenger, but you wanted to follow a bunch of people and have an account, but you didn't want anyone to see anything you ever said. Now, there is a problem also with using these VPNs that, yes... Your traffic is basically sort of encrypted, and then it pops out. So it comes out of nowhere in Sweden, and ostensibly the person you trust to set up this VPN is not keeping any logs, which Mm. is doable. Anyone observing that traffic might be able to figure out who you are or what you're up to 
just because the traffic is still all associated with your tunnel in some yep, fashion. Yeah, the people running the VPN might be able to figure it out, but anyone else who's, you know, let's say I visit Google.com, Google.com is just going to see like Anon 1501.vpn, yep. whatever. They don't know who I am, but the people running the VPN can be like, aha, Anon 1501 just visited Google, and that is an IP address for New York. It is Scott. Ha 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 ha. If I, but, but, but they have to be actively monitoring if they're not logging. If but they if are I were logging, a government, you're fucked. If you were a government, you could just mm. sniff all of the traffic coming out of one of these VPN egress points. And over time, from that aggregated data, I mean, if you use the VPN and you keep logging into your Gmail through it, mm. then eventually but they'll But not know, if that's SSL Gmail. Exactly. But then they could figure out that that gmail account is using iPredator. Mm. maybe then they do some heuristics or things to figure out what other traffic was happening around the same time that you checked your email and then oh well there is a search for a thing that is definitely in the hometown of the person we're looking at and we know he uses gmail and there are ways if someone's out to get you to start to put a picture together but it's way it's difficult it's a ton of effort basically huge expensive effort to figure something like that out perhaps even closing on the not impossible but improbable territories so really this is why it's so you know these are easy things to do a VPN you set up once you just click to activate it encrypting a thing you type in a password only a slight inconvenience and it already raises the security level of doing these particular activities storing data privately and visiting websites and doing internet privately to such a high level that the government, a, a very large government thing would have to be specifically after you and they're after you so much that they're going to expend a ton of resources to come after you. And if they're after you to that point, they've already put a physical key logger in your computer with a warrant. Maybe. <laughs> check the back of your computer. Yeah, well, you'd probably want to check inside. That too, case. but it's like if you see anything on you know, your keyboard cable between your keyboard and the computer where it's supposed to be. <laughs> or How many of our listeners in- are going to go to their work see the like ps2 to usb converter and unplug it oops yeah no i think you know what that is but i'm sure they make a ps2 to usb converter that is also a key logger yeah. and i'm sure they also make key loggers that you can put inside of the keyboard where no one would see or it. hell if you work by an office window i'll just have an hd camera and a telephoto lens pointed at your desk and just video you typing and a really and tiny screen. camera that you couldn't possibly notice unless you lurked really hard for it you paranoid yeah. nut job or just arrest you and beat you with a hammer until you fess up to whatever it is they want you to fess up to. That's so much easier, but that kind of confession doesn't stand in court, at least not in this country. So, <laughs> level three, and I think this is a really kind of sub-level, but if you're super paranoid, you make one of those encrypted volumes, and you do the true crypt style, yo dog, I can type in any password you want, they all return gibberish. Right, so basically... You, this is a step further than level one where you're encrypting this folder. You encrypt every hard drive you have, every disk, every, everything is encrypted with passwords. When you turn the computer on, you have to type in a password to get the thing to boot. But if you type the wrong password, it doesn't say wrong password. It just decrypts using that. And, you know, it may or may not work. Or you set it up to where you have multiple volumes. You have, if you type in password A, you get your real data. Password B, you get a hard drive with some uh, innocuous porn on it, and that's it. Yeah, legal porn. Yeah. Not illegal. <laughs> <laughs> so that way, you know, for example, with something like this, you could, if you wanted to bring data over a country border without using my internet method, right? Like and if it's the a country, com- say you're going for to example, a country For example, in like- China, that internet is not safe to upload over, right? Yep. You would arrive at the airport and customs, if they're jerky, would be like, let me look at your laptop. And then they say, type in a password, unlock this thing. Now you're going to, you are allowed to say no and you could try to fight that. And well, it's China. You might not be allowed to say no. That's true. But, I mean, you're coming into the U.S. Probably forget that to say Belarusia. You're sure. going there. You're in some weird country. You don't want to type in your password. You shouldn't have to. That's Right, but why not type in the fake password that makes the computer boot into some innocuous looking OS? The customs agent will be way too dumb to know anything about that. Now, you'll totally fool them. There is a way that this is called deniable encryption, Mm -hmm. that there's no mathematical way to prove that there is or is not another volume that you didn't show them because the data, but in a pre decrypted state, so an encrypted state, is basically indistinguishable from random data because all the places where you don't have data stored it is random yep let me let me explain this better right so let's say i have a text file i want to encrypt it and it's got a three-letter word in it the word is cat 
I want to send the secret message of cat to Rim, right? So I encrypt it. And now it says DXQ instead of cat. And we know if you have the right key to decrypt DXQ, it turns it into cat. And that's how you know the right key. Now, there is another key. But what if somebody uses a wrong key and it decrypts and it says dog? Well, how do you know that that wasn't the right key? If that person doesn't know, right? See, I know that the right answer is cat. So I know if they use a key and it says dog, that they got the wrong key. But they don't know. They decrypt with their key and it says dog. And that very well could be the right answer. They don't know what the right answer is. That's why they're trying to decrypt it. So if you have encryption that works that way, right, on a higher level with a more complicated example, right, they type in some password, they think they got it right, really they got it wrong, and they didn't find anything. This but they is why think that they've already cracked it, and now you're, le- you're, you're innocent now. They didn't find shit. This is why one-time pads are actually unbreakable as long as, they, as the protocol is followed. Mm, that's Same like reason. level 100. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to one time, <laughs> real one-time pads in the end. Right. Now, the other trouble with this... The reason this is level three is that it is actually a giant pain in the ass to maintain this dual layered encryption at all times. Because, Mm -hmm. sure, you type in your password and your computer boots and it's Windows 98 that's never visited a website. Uh, uh, uh. Or you use the other one. They say they monitor you over time. They start to figure out that you're obviously doing something because all this other data keeps changing in a sort of uniform manner because of swap space and all these other things in your real encrypted volume. So they could make a mathematical case that there was data in that other area that you refused to decrypt. But they can't find out what it is. They can't find out what it is unless they beat it out of you with a tire iron. (laughs) Which, again, is not admissible in court, at least in this country. So... Level four, GPG. Mm, pain in the ass time. Basically, try emailing Will Wheaton. Right. <laughs> I don't. I think he makes you sign. I don't he, think he, he makes he, you encrypt. So he he will not respond to you unless you sign. Mm. But he is more likely to respond, as far as he says at least, if you also encrypt. But you don't right. have to encrypt everything. So we did an episode on private public key encryption. You can go back and listen to it. Not going to explain it again. But basically. You can use a method. You basically would take Will Wheaton's public key, encrypt an email, sign it with your private key, and then mail it to him. And now when he receives that email, he can both, A, he's the only one in the world that can decrypt and read that email, and B, he can mathematically 100% verify that email came from you and isn't like a fake email from someone else that wasn't you. And then he can likewise do the same to you using your public key to encrypt a response, mail it to you, sign it with his private key, and when you receive his email, you will 100% know for a fact that email came from Will Wheaton. No one besides you was able to read that email no matter how much spying they were doing and such and such now this is easy to do in theory it's easy to do for one-off emails to will wheaton well yeah well even that there in are general, free tools free software you click you copy and paste a few keys in i mean literally the, the, you use like gpg and you just copy and paste and encrypt it like in a little program and then paste the results it's a yeah. blob of gibberish you write your email in one program you copy paste it you click the encrypt button you copy paste it you push send right it's it's a little bit of effort you know, but it's not the worst thing ever. And if you really need to do it, you can do it. But it, the reason it's a level three inconvenience is... Level yeah, four. Who wants to run all your... Oh, level four. The reason it's so inconvenient, who wants to run all your fucking shit through the... Imagine if you're sending every email like this, like, well, Wheaton must. God, that's a pain in the ass. Now, there are e- plugins for, like, Chrome... That can automate this for like Gmail. But it's still a pain in the ass, and it makes it very hard to email people who do not use this. Now, it's mostly a pain in the ass because, yeah, like you said, if I email like grandma, she's either going to see my signature block at the bottom and be confused by it or not be able to decrypt the mail if I actually encrypted it. Mm-hmm. But the benefits you get if you care about the level of security is that while the metadata is still there, the stuff we know the NSA is gathering, who emails whom, they still get that. But there is no way for them to read the content, and there is no way for anyone out there to fake being you. Mm -hmm. You can verify the identity of the person you're talking to, and you can verify the contents of the message, and you can prevent the message from being read by outsiders. But... It's a giant pain in the ass, and really, this is where we get to the... From level five and or four and on... There was level four, sorry. 
You, you, you. If you're using this, you're up to bad things that are worth protecting and keeping or secret. Or you're me in high school where I'm just bored and I have plenty of free time, and government's not going to look at my stuff. Or maybe you want to get into cryptography as like your profession. Then yeah, yeah, or something like that. You know, but these are all the or levels use it where, for a business purpose. Legitimately, where you need to coordinate in sideband channels, like coordinate somewhere else with the people with whom you want to communicate and arrange for your secure communication. Hmm. You need to agree with your friends. This is my public key. You know, we will use GPG to talk to each other when we're doing our shady business. You've shared keys and made arrangements ahead of time. Now, you can share, because this is public-private key encryption, you don't need to worry about people intercepting your key. Your private key should be encrypted with your level one bullshit already. Mm-hmm. So you can you can give someone the public key publicly. You can post it on the internet. The public key will not help anyone steal your stuff. In fact, you have to publish it if you want strangers to be able to email you with it. Mm-hmm. But it does require a little bit of coordination. So beyond here, this is basically the crazy stuff. Yep. Like le- I, well, I would you, say, this GPG VoIP, which is basically the same idea with the email, only with talking over voice. So you can make secure internet phone calls that are just as secure as the email to Will Wheaton where the other person knows it is you calling with no doubt you know it's them calling and it's 100% impossible for anyone to tap that like those government phones where you pick up a, you know you both pick up you start talking but before you say anything important both your phones show a number and you say the number you see to the other person and there's a way to prove that they match or not and if they don't match then there's a man in the middle attack going on yep. or some other shenanigans mm-hmm. now in the old days I actually used it and it worked uh, but when, when back when he'd use PGP, and you can read the whole history of PGP, pretty good. Uh, that was how the EFF seen? got started. Exactly. PGP is a crazy story. GPG is kind of the current open source. Well, OpenSSL also does a lot of this stuff. Yeah, it does. But there was PGP phone, which in the old days would encrypt the audio stream, so you could use a coupler and have phone calls over POTS, mm-hmm. and it would be encrypted, and it worked. Okay. You would plug a telephone into your modem and your computer would basically encrypt everything when it came in the modem from your handheld phone and then send it on the internet. This is now this is the same era where the software that did this also had Tempest mode where you could tell it to when you read a, P, a PGP encrypted message, it would display it in a window that can't be copy pasted out of. Can't take a screenshot of it. I guess you could if you fuck around. You can take a camera and take a picture yeah, of it. But it also would display it in a really low contrast, hard to read window to protect you against Tempest attacks. Mm-hmm. Tempest is not much of a concern. If you're if you are worried about Tempest type attacks, one, I see no evidence that they're really possible now that we don't use tubes and CRTs anymore. <laughs> and two, uh, the governments that are after you have probably already just kidnapped you. <laughs> If you're <laughs> yeah, there's a point at which like you're protecting from such ridiculous nonsense that's theoretically possible. Like, yeah, the government could have like a super telescope on a satellite that's aimed at the ground and peeping in your window. But you can beat that shit with a fucking curtain. So they're probably not wasting their time and money on that. They probably can just walk up to your house and bash the door down, which is as simple as a curtain. Right. <laughs> then I was the point of using a giant satellite. It's not, you know, you have to think about what they're using against you to the point where you're getting a little ridiculous. So level, if I, you know, level numbers don't really matter that much, but if I had to say what, it, what level six is, this is if you for real care and you don't even want the metadata to be able to be used. And this is where you need not just deniable encryption, but deniable communication. Mm-hmm. Now, you might the, the, a good example of this are the old famous number stations. Mm. These are radio networks, radio stations that just broadcast someone saying numbers. Just if you you can listen to these things with radios all over the world, and you'll just hear seven, nine, four, three, eight, just on and on and on. Nerds in the 60s and 70s would record these things and analyze them and think it's UFOs and freak out about them. The modern equivalent of that would be you, every day, post 512 seemingly random bytes publicly to, like, 4chan. Mm. Every day, every single day at the same time, 512 bytes. There is no way to know who is reading that. Reliably, because it's posted publicly, Mm -hmm. especially if it's posted publicly somewhere where there isn't 
a logging or a mechanism to see who made HTTP request to see it. Say you post it in line with a thousand other people who post their 512s in the same forum at the same time in the same thread. Mm -hmm. So every day you post it and then maybe every day you look at it as well. All right. There's not much data you can get from that. You can't use the metadata of this phone number called this phone number, this email address, email this well, email address. Well, you're saying it's just a few bytes. Why not upload a gigabyte every day? You could, but the idea is that you upload that 512 bytes and say I'm a, you know, Scott and I, we've separated and we're off doing our nefarious business. And every day, Scott just checks that site with the you know, million separate 512 byte things that every other person puts up there. Maybe we even have some bots putting random ones up there, whatever. And every day, he uses his private secret one-time pad key to decrypt one of them and see if I had a message for him. And most of the time, the message is nothing. But the one time, the looky message is like, looky mighty, <laughs> activate, it's time to play Counter-Strike. <laughs> or and meet me at the bar. What if I run out of one-time pad pages? Well, then you got to exchange pads again. Mm, mm, mm. Now, another way to do this sort of thing is with that old network called Waste. We've talked about it a lot. I'm just going to link to it. You can look it up. It's basically a network like a sort of private network that you set up, like a bunch of VPNs between you and all your friends that not only are encrypted and relatively private, and it's a friend list where you, tr you have a circle of trust and you add people that you trust and no one else, but you can set it up to where it is sending a small amount of data constantly between all the nodes at all times. So that if you send data... The data just replaces the noise, and there's no way to know that you're communicating or not. As far as anyone's observing, you're always communicating and never communicating. Yeah, think about this, right? When you go on BitTorrents, let's say you have an encrypted BitTorrent, but your ISP is watching you, and they know, well, look at this. He's using a VPN encrypted BitTorrents. They don't even know that. He's sending some datas. He downloaded exactly 2.73 gigabytes of data. And that seems to be exactly the same number of bits in the newest hot movie in the theaters right now. If I download that torrent that's real popular from Pirate Bay, it's exactly the same file size. Mm. Or think about the news or counterterrorism. Ever ever hear someone on the news say something like, due to increased chatter, they raise the security level? Mm. What that means is people nodes on some network that they're watching because the you know the quote bad guys use those nodes suddenly have a flurry of communication where there wasn't any before even if they don't know what that communication is you know some hornet's nest somewhere got poked exactly right bad you know if you think about it you know think about say Kineticon for 10 Kineticon was a terrorist organization which is <laughs> which is the farthest from could I don't not know, be if further you go, if you go to some of those late night panels maybe right <laughs> guess what as it gets closer to Kineticon the Kineticon people talk to each other a lot more, right? And at the day of Kineticon, we talk to each other like crazy. Well, if we were terrorists, the day of our terrorist attack, there's going to be a lot more talking than like the year before when we're simply in like preparation, discussion, planning mode, right? There's a lot less talking going on. So even without knowing what we're saying, it's encrypted. If they can see how many bits we're sharing, right? More calls, more letters, more whatever it is, right? It's getting closer to the time. So they're watching out, looking for where we're going to strike. Right? So if you just have fake, you know, un, you know, deniable, encrypted, sort of messy, random nonsense communicating at all times, you're masking the chatter level. So they'll never know, is today the day or is tomorrow the day or a year from now? You just maintain that for a long period of time and they'll never know the day you're going to strike because the day you're going to strike, the chatter level doesn't increase. It's just the fake chatter gets replaced with real chatter and the level remains the same. Exactly. And it's, you know, you set these systems up to where if you try to send a lot of data all at once, it throttles it down to send it at the predefined rate. It's always sending gibberish. Yeah. In case you're accidentally talking more than, you know, the, uh, the fake chatter. So you don't give yourselves away by accidentally like uploading a way too big file to the other guy or something. You now, the problem with everything at level six is that you need to seriously prearrange everything ahead of time with the people with whom you want to communicate, and, and you have to do it securely. And you need to have a high level of technological skill, probably coding abilities, if not hardware abilities. But like a public key you can give someone. That's yes. less secure encryption than a one-time pad, which is, if you follow protocol, unbreakable. Literally unbreakable. There is no technology. Mathematically, 100% impossible. If I encrypt a message with a one-time pad, we can just give it to the NSA, be like, here you go. 
Go even, nuts. It's not one of those things where like, oh, if they had a super quantum computer and a billion years, they could figure it out. It's like, no. If they had an entire universe simulation, you know, and a hundred universe simulations inside through a dimensional door... They could never figure it out. Of course, ever. at that point, maybe they can just read your mind and steal the data out of it directly. That would be easier than cracking it, yes. So, to exchange, and here's the difficulty. Scott and I could exchange privately a one-time pad that we construct ourselves right now with all those dice that are sitting over there in the studio. Yep. And then we keep them in our wallets and go our separate ways. And 20 years from now, when we're up to our bullshit, we use that pad. Mm-hmm. Think about how much planning that takes. I can't just email him the pad. <laughs> yeah, then the government would see the pad. And if I encrypt the pad with PGP, now it's not unbreakable one-time pad. It's as breakable as PGP is breakable. Yep. Now, what if, What if you know, the government comes and hits me on the head and takes the pad? Well, fuck. Exactly. And then the problem with a one-time pad on its own is that now I don't have any way to know it's not you anymore unless we also have some sort of identity management. So you want to encrypt PGP within the one-time pad. And what if we fuck up and I lose a page or I'm a page off? Do you know how many stories from World War II and the Cold War where someone something got decrypted come down to someone reused a page in their one-time pad? Yep. As soon as you reuse it, you're fucked. Yep. Cannot reuse a page now, ever. People have done clever things. Like if you do XOR-style encryption, uh, there, there was a program that did this. I'm sure you could find it again, or you could just write something in Python. The idea was you prearrange CDs. Or, you know, the albums. And then when the time comes, I take the second disc of The Wall, and you know to take the second disc of The Wall, and that happens to be what we're using for our one-time pad. Well, you know you do, and all your safe houses... It's not technically right? a one-time pad. Yeah, all your safe houses, you arrange, right, probably cassette tapes or something, or SD cards, or who knows what, right, in like a row on a shelf, probably CD, you know, CDs or albums would be more innocuous, right? And then that is the one time pad. You never listen to them and they're in order. So when you have to use one, you start at the left, right? And then you leave the last one you use sticking out and you always use one at a time exactly. So you can send, you know, I guess if you use CDs, 640 megabytes of data to the other person. You can burn 800 megabytes if you really wing it. I guess maybe, yeah, but you send that many, that much data to the other guy at once at a time, and then you switch to the next album every single, you know. But again, all this stuff requires ridiculous forethought, and you have to do the One forethought. person has to go out all the safe houses and arrange all the CDs. And now you need to do spy shit to make sure you don't get tracked. Do it in winter, wear a big hat, use cash, don't use a rental car, don't have the safe houses all be in a circle around your house. <laughs> <laughs> you should watch Ghost in the Shell for more info. Yeah. And I mean, beyond that is things like the you no are not, If you are doing something to where you need this level of protection, stop doing it. Well, no, in the United States. Stop doing whatever you're doing. Uh, the, you're the up port, to no good. The, the kids in Egypt and the kids in Turkey and they all don't the, need They don't need safe houses and one-time pads. They might. I don't think so. They might. I think PGP would be the limit for them. But the level... Well, the thing is, PGP is going to stop most governments from doing much about what it's you're going to stop pretty much anybody. But level seven, like beyond that is seriously... You bought a used laptop with cash. It doesn't have a hard drive in it, just RAM. You boot it with a Linux Live CD, then take the CD out. You access it from behind the Starbucks wearing masks, and you walked there taking a roundabout way, and after you did your, your, your data dump, you left the laptop behind. Yes. Maybe destroying At, it. Maybe destroying it. At least smashing the RAM. The other parts you don't really need to destroy. And then you're, wor you're more worried about stuff like, was there a security camera? Yep. Where I went. Did I leave a fingerprint? Mm, did I leave a DNA hair? Yep. Did, was it, was the cam, did the store I bought the laptop from two years ago with cash still keep its video footage of that time that I walked in and bought that laptop with cash? Could the government find the serial number of the hardware of the laptop, figure out where it was bought and when it was bought? Is and, the government and, already and, watching me? That's, you know, this is the level of the crazy, these high levels here. You have to set this stuff up before anyone who cares about your bullshit starts watching you. Yeah, imagine the government started watching us now. We didn't make the one-time pad yet, so when we make the one-time pad, they're watching us make the one-time pad, and it's useless. Yep. We I have do to make the one-time pad before you know, Scott, they get their eye on us. Because I was really interested in this stuff in middle and high school. You made one. I do have pre-arranged one-time codes and one-time pads with a number of people. Sure. Yeah. You know, basically, think of it like this. 
if the eye of Sauron is already upon you, yeah. <laughs> it sees. It, it, it doesn't matter what the fuck you do. If I show up, you in, have to avoid the eye. If I show up in China and I'm going to do some stuff the Chinese government doesn't like, they're watching me from the moment I show up. I can't exchange keys with my contact once I'm already there. That would be dumb. So yeah, there's not much you can do about this stuff. Really, really, just use SSL, use VPNs and PGP if you really want to protect yourself, and only worry about the rest, I guess, if you're actually up to bad stuff or you're, you know something we don't and you're fighting a real fight. I mean, if you're up to bad stuff, step one, get a computer science degree or, and learn it. Then or, or do all this for fun, because actually it was really fun to set all this stuff up in high school. But useless. Yeah, totally. You, I could, <laughs> I could arrange a secure meeting with someone I haven't seen in like fifteen years if I really wanted to right now. Whoa! If they still remember and have it. This has been Geek Nights with Rim and Scott. Special thanks to DJ Pretzel for the opening music, Kat Lee for web design, and Brando K for the logos. Be sure to visit our website at frontrowcrew.com for show notes, discussion, news, and more. Remember, Geek Nights is not one, but four different shows. SciTech Mondays, Gaming Tuesdays, Anime Comic Wednesdays, and Indiscriminate Thursdays. Geek Nights is distributed under a Creative Commons Attribution 3.0 license. Geek Nights is recorded live with no studio and no audience. But unlike those other late shows, it's actually recorded at night. <laughs>